Hi everybody, I hope all is well. So this question comes up quite often in the comments section and in different variations, but it's basically the same question. And I believe that this issue that you're all mentioning in the comments is going to get worse and worse as time progresses. Uh, there's been a lot of changes in the market for electric, electronic components. A lot of the things, if you work on vintage equipment like we do on this channel, you're going to see more and more of these transistors and capacitors and components that we need in order to properly restore this gear. We're going to see them become more and more scarce because what's happening is every, the, the, everything's shifting to, for instance, surface mount components. Um, and integrated circuits and things like that where a lot of these uh, what I'm going to call legacy components are becoming obsolete. So what are we going to do? Now I'm going to start out by saying there is no one simple answer and I'm also going to say that from now on we're always going to be chasing a moving target. So what I tell you at this time that I'm making this video is going to change undoubtedly will change over time and the most important skill we need to learn is how to adapt okay so this all came about in my last video series where we did the fisher rs 2010 and one of the things we did was we replaced one of those stk 0080 uh, Darlington power pack modules in the power amplifier with a discrete component solution. <laughs> now here's the irony of the whole story. Those discrete component boards that, that we built were designed because those SDK 0080s are getting very hard to find. And the ones that are out there are quite often uh, counterfeits some are better counterfeits than others. They're all counterfeits now. Some of them are pretty faithful to the original design and they work somewhat well, but most of them, if not all of them, will not hold up to the same uh, rigors <laughs> or the same torture test as the original Sanyo STK modules. And what we found out is that Fisher is already pushing that STK module to its maximum. So anything you put in there that's a, a counterfeit that isn't, doesn't have the silicon in it to handle those maximum values you know, of the original, they're going to fail prematurely and, and we've seen that. So this, we came up with this solution several years ago uh, and go back to that series and you can see what I'm talking about, the Fisher RS 2010 restoration that I did. And I give credit to the individual who designed this uh, replacement discrete component circuit and you know, designed a circuit board to hold all this. And it's a very elegant solution. But ironically, the components that he used in these that were plentiful at the time that he made these are now becoming hard to find. And throughout the history of this module, which started out, I believe, in 2016, they actually became aware of this and they released updates to this thread here on Audio Karma. Go back and look that up. I'm not going to give you all that again. And they have some alternate ones. Well, now even the alternate ones are starting to dry up and disappear. So how can we do this ourselves? Okay, um, most of the time I get these emails that say, or these, these comments that say, what do I use in place of this? This, I looked on Mauser and I can't find it. And just expect you to always give, you know, well, in order for me to do that, I have to do a bunch of research to be able to answer your comment on YouTube. And that's a lot of work on my part that I don't have time to do. So I am a very strong proponent of if you give someone a fish, they eat for a day. If you teach a person how to fish, they can eat for the rest of their life. And really, if you really are serious about doing this, I would highly recommend you learn the skill that I'm gonna show you today 
of at least the basics of how to cross-reference uh, a component to a modern one that's available. Okay, so I'll show you a couple things in this video and hopefully you'll be able to do this yourself. We're going to use this STK module and these transistors here as an example. Okay, throughout this video we're just going to narrow it down to one transistor because if you can do this with one transistor, you can do it with any transistor, okay? I'll show you my method. So right here is the original transistor that they're calling for in the design. It's an NJW November Juliet Whiskey 3281. And there it is. And this package is known as a TO3P for plastic. Okay, the original TO3 transistor are those oval metal transistors that are kind of in an oval shaped can. And they, this is designed to take the place of it. And these can be mounted to a circuit board. And they have the same characteristics uh, as far as, you know, the power handling and things. They have series of them that are similar or identical to a TO3. It's just an updated package. And by the way, the spacing of the pins are designed that if you bend these over, they will fit in the socket of a TO3 case. So here's our first lesson. If you have a transistor like this, this is a TO3 case. Okay, don't pay attention to the part number on there. I'm covering it up because these aren't equivalents to one another <laughs> as far as the transistors themselves, but the packages. If you look, they are lined up in the same manner. If I flip this over like this and I bend these pins down, this is going to be the emitter, the middle pin is going to be the collector, and this pin is going to be the base. And if you notice, they are exactly spaced the same way. So if this were plugged into a socket on a heat sink, you could actually use one of the holes. And if you look here, even the holes line up. And you can see where the, where the shoulder is on the pin. If you line the holes up and bend it right at the shoulder, it will be exactly the same dimensions as this. And you can find an equivalent transistor in this package and it will replace this package. Okay. So first thing to remember is different case styles and their updated versions. There is also a smaller version of this called a, this is called a TO3. This is a TO3P for plastic. There is also a TO66, which looks exactly like this, only miniaturized. It's smaller than this. And the transistor, the equivalent of that in, in this type of package is called a TO220. And the same thing holds true for it. You can fold the pins over, they line up, same thing. Now let's just go through the scenario here. When we print out this from the Audio Karma website, there's, it's a multi-page document here. You can actually, you know, print it from the website and from the thread. And there's a bill of materials that you can go to Mauser, DigiKey, or Arrow, or any number of places, and you can click on it. And they even have a shopping cart saved on the Mauser website where if you click on it, it has all these parts enough to make one module in one shopping cart. And you can just... Act, just click on the shopping cart and then click purchase and check out, you know, and you can buy it and it, it's enough to, for this whole thing. And if you double it, you have enough to make two modules for a stereo set. It's very convenient. And that was the cool, the, the way to do it <laughs> when this first came out. But now some of these components are no longer available. So what's going to happen is you're going to click on this. You're going to go to Mauser. You're going to go to this Q4 here. Again, we're using this as the example. And you're going to try to order one of these NJW3281s. Now, I hope I have this whole thing in there on my monitor. But when you try to select this on Mauser's website, if you scroll down, so here's if you just go up in the search box and type in NJW3281, it'll come up with this page. Okay, it'll come up with a search page on the Mauser website. 
it'll show you all of the characteristics. Okay, so right along up here, and yes, I'm going to use my lightsaber chopstick that lights up. <laughs> if you go along here, it's gonna show you all the characteristics of the transistor. This is gonna be important here uh, later on in the video. If you go down here and you look, there they're listed. So it sounds like you can get them. But if you try to order one, you have to look at where it says availability right up here. Okay, availability. There's 4,708 of them. Wow. Well, keep reading. 4,708 expected on February 28th of 2024. The date today is August of 2023. So you're talking months away. The other uh, manufacturer or the other version of them that they sell, the non-G, so there's a 3281G and a 3281, and they're pretty much identical, uh, is a non-stocked part. Now it says you can call for quote which means they might be able to still order them from OnSemi, who is the manufacturer of them, but you're gonna look at maybe a two year lead time when you try to do something like that. And even this, you know, they're expected in February. It doesn't mean you're going to get them. So if you back order these and say, I'll just wait six months or whatever, you may be very disappointed because that time may come and go and will not happen. I'll give you an example. Just to experiment one day, I tried to order uh, in a big order, a shopping cart order, a couple of just small uh, film capacitors. It was on some insignificant value. It was, you know, like uh, 100 nanofarads at 50 volts or something. It was just one of those little square plastic ones. It doesn't matter. It was just a component. And it said on back order for three months, it was something like that. So I left it on back order. So my whole shopping cart got shipped and delivered and I received it, no problem. And that one, the, those two little capacitors in the order went on back order. And every month or two, I would get an email from Mauser or DigiKey, I forget who it was. And they would update me on the status of the order saying it's still on back order. Do you want to continue? Do you want to continue? And I'd click, yep, 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 over and over again, right? Well, long story short, it took almost a year and a half for that thing to show up. It was literally, the order was less than $2. It wasn't about the money that, it, that I cared about. It was the fact that that's how long it took. So putting something on back order or relying on these dates is not a viable option. Okay. I know I'm taking a long time on something here, but I need to give you this, the background. Again, I'm teaching you how to fish. Now, our first line of defense is to try to take the easy way out and Google search or read the documents to see if someone has done it for you already. And sometimes you can have some luck at that. So if you look here, they did an updated release of the bill of materials and they put this note at the end, alternates. And if you look for Q4, you can use an NJW0281, okay, instead of a 3281. You can also use a 2SC5242 OTU. So let's see if we can get those to come up on the Mauser website. Okay, now I've done the same thing. I've gone in the search bar and I typed in 0281. And look what happens. <laughs> we go there and there is a NJW0281G and it says just on order. It doesn't say expected. And if you go here, you can click on where it says view dates and it shows you that they're expecting 1,786 of them to show up October of 2023. So that's, since this is uh, August, that's two months from now. Or January of 2024 is another shipment. The factory lead time though is 53 weeks, which is just over one year. 
So it means they ordered them, they're in the queue to get them, but, and this is what they're expecting it to be, but there's no guarantee. So the bottom line is, if you wanna build one of these now, this is not a viable option. Just like the, the previous component, these ones don't work either, they're not available. And if I scroll down to these, these two here are not even available at all because Diodes Incorporated makes one. And there is a the non-G version again that's not available. And again, non-stocked, quote, call for quote, all right? And if you look down here, they listed another component called an NJW0302G, and it might be an option because it listed it along with this but we really don't know. We would have to look and compare all these things. And looking at it, it appears as though they might, it might work, okay? And the reason it's, it has a different number is that it may be an older part run or something like that, but they do have 1,263 of those in stock. So there's one option. The other option was that 2SC5242, and I looked at that as well. And if I go up here, they show it, and they show 5,145 of those in stock as well. So we could use those. And again, another very similar component. Now, instead of, you know, these, this one here, I think, is a... 100, would, would we say it was 150 watt component and these ones are 130 watt. That's the maximum dissipation that they can dissipate in energy and heat. Um, so this is a not quite as robust of a transistor, but for the module, if you're using it in a 50 watt amplifier, you'll probably be okay and you could use this. If you're using this in that RS2010, you might be pushing it a little bit. Okay, so just so you know, and you'd have to look at all of the all of the specs. So let's go back to this one down here because this looks like an identical, uh, you know, replacement for the original one that we're trying to replace. So let's click on it for a minute. All right, and there it is, and let's look at the data sheet. Why do we want to look at the data sheet? Well, there's a reason here. Click on this, and you can see when we look at this first one, this 0281G, you can see that that is a NPN, and if you look below it, it shows its complement, the, the 0302G. Now, why do I care about that? Well, Here's the thing, if you're going to replace the NPN transistor with this series, you also have to replace the PNP with its proper complement. In other words, instead of using the NJW1302 that they're calling for, you have to use this. And that 1302, by the way, might be in stock. <laughs> but if you can't get the, the set, the pair, the complementary pair, it's not going to work out for you because they're different. They're slightly different, okay? They'll work in the circuit if you put them together as a complementary pair, but they may not necessarily work as well together if you don't use the same complementary pair. So that means if I'm going to replace the NPN one with this, I have to look and see if the NJW0302 is also in stock at Mauser. So when we look there, NJW0302, they actually show 1,263 in stock. So we can order those as, as replacements. So that's the first thing, there's the first way that we can get around not having that transistor. But what happens if none of those transistors are in stock? How do we get around that? Let's look at that next. Let's go back to our original example, the NJW3281. And we need to find an equivalent for it. And none of the ones, we're just hypothetically saying, 
none of the replacements that they listed in the parts list are available. Let's just pretend for a moment, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go right back up there where we were on that, on that page. We're gonna click the data sheet for it and we're gonna print out the data sheet for the NJW3281 and NJW1302, this, this pair, right? Because remember, we want, we want the matched pair if we can, the complementary pair. So I've gone ahead and did that. Okay, and you don't have to print it. Of course, you can just open it up on your computer and look at it, that's fine. I'm printing it out to make it a little easier for the video. And if we look, there's gonna be a few things that we're gonna be interested in, okay? First of all is the case style, okay? This is a TO3P case. So we wanna find something in a similar case style to this. And there, just like this can replace a TO3, there are also other packages very similar to this that can replace this package and be a drop-in replacement for this. And we don't wanna leave any of those out because obviously we may be, you know, overlooking components that are available right now we can buy that will work for this thing. So we'll get into that in a minute. The other thing we want to look at is the ratings charts of the transistor. Okay, so let's zoom in a little bit. And you can see, first of all, if you look the the VCE, V CB and so forth, they're showing that these are 250 volt, and th these are two of the big ones that you want to look at, your collector to emitter breakdown voltage and your collector to base breakdown voltage. And quite often those two voltages are going to be the same or very close to one another. Not always, but in most cases. And you can see they're rating these at 250 volts, and that is a pretty hefty transistor, okay? <laughs> so that's the first thing I look at. Another thing I looked at is the continuous collector current. The, what's the maximum, you know, if you, from collector to emitter, what is the maximum current we can, we can uh, conduct? And of course, there's a little bit of base to emitter current too, but collector current. And they're saying in this transistor, it's 15 amps. So this is a very substantial transistor. What is the total power dissipation? In this one, it's a 200 watt. You might say to yourself, I know Ohm's law, and Ohm's law says that watts equals volts times amps, right? And if you take 15 amps times 250 volts, that's way, way, way more than 200 watts. <laughs> well, that's because 200 watts is the maximum dissipation of heat that this transistor can handle before it starts to fail. And so what that means is, any combination of up to 250 volts and up to 15 amps that does not exceed 200 watts when you multiply them together, okay? So if you have a 10 amp uh, collector current and you're, you're putting 25 volts on the collector to emitter, that would be 250 watts and that would exceed this. But if you have 10 amps of collector current and 20 volts, <laughs> you would be right at 200 watts and you would be running this thing at the very, very edge of failure and it's probably going to fail because <laughs> you're pushing it to its actual maximum. But if you have 50 volts on, in the circuit, which is a pretty, pretty common voltage, right? Somewhere around 50 volts in an amplifier and you're going to have maybe one or two amps there, okay? So two amps, let's say. 2 times 50 is 100, and that would be 100 watts of dissipation, and that's well within the range of this transistor. So these things work together, okay? Now, some of these other things are also important, but usually the amplifier, the, in an amplifier, when you're looking at power transistors, those are your main things you're looking at. Now, going to the next page, we have some other important information. Okay, and again, if we look at the current gain, in some instances, the gain is very important, but take a look. It can vary 
It can be anywhere from 75 minimum to 150 maximum for this transistor and still be considered, you know, a valid component, you know, a functioning component. So most transit, most amplifier designs are made in such a way as to minimize the influence of the forward current gain so that they try to control that through the emitter resistor and through some different techniques in the circuit design. So you basically just want a transistor that's going to be somewhere in this range when you're replacing it. But I don't, in, in power transistor applications, I don't look at the HFE as much as I do the other things we just talked about. Now, another thing that can be a source of debate and can sometimes be an issue and most times not be an issue is the transition frequency. What is transition frequency, you ask? Transition frequency is the frequency in hertz at which the transistor has no gain. It has a unity gain. In other words, there is no forward current gain. Uh, uh, as opposed to what you put on the base emitter versus the collector emitter, they're both going to have the same current. So whatever current you put in is the same current that'll be out. And anything beyond that, the transistor will actually have negative gain. And any frequency lower than that, the transistor will have higher gain up to its maximum frequency. So this is a 30 megahertz component, all right? And, well, you say to yourself, well, Tony, you're working on an amplifier. An amplifier doesn't go over 20 kilohertz. <laughs> Why do I care? Well, a lot of these components for the power transistors will be 3 or 4 megahertz, which is literally 10 times less than this. Why would we care? It's still way higher than 20 kilohertz. Well, where this comes into play is two places. Number one, when you're using feedback, okay, almost all transistorized amplifiers from this era that we work on use global negative feedback. That feedback loop has to happen very, very quickly or it will affect the frequency domain, uh, you know, of the transit of the amplifier. It will actually affect the, the effective gain of the circuit because the feedback has to work very quickly. So this does make a difference in some designs. The other thing is if you go the opposite direction, if the amplifier is a very old design and you're, you're replacing an old transistor that originally had maybe a 1 or 2 megahertz transition frequency and now you put this 30 megahertz transistor and you're thinking more is better. What this can do is <laughs> this transistor will react to high frequencies much better because it's a high frequency transistor. What that means is little things, little designs flaws in the circuit that didn't mean anything before. Okay, for instance, if the amplifier can oscillate, let's say at 10 megahertz, and you put a two megahertz FT transistor in there, that 10 megahertz oscillation will pretty much be squelched out by the fact that the transistor can't react that fast, so it's not going to pass that oscillation through the circuit. Whereas you put this in there, it'll pass it right through, and all of a sudden you've got this wild oscillation at high frequency, and you're burning up the amplifier, and you don't know why. That's why. Because this circuit was designed to work with this type of transistor, you you want to stick with this right here. Now, what would be the downside? If I used a transistor that was 4 megahertz, it would work in most cases. In this amplifier, it will work. Okay? You probably won't have any problems. Will it change the if we do the frequency analysis, you know, <laughs> like I do on the on my scope? Maybe. I've never seen it. So, Again, some people claim to be able to hear this. Other people claim that it doesn't make a difference. I'm going to leave that up to you. But just be aware of that. Those are the things I look for. Okay? So, now that we're armed with what we have to do, let's go up and actually go through the exercise of this on the 
uh, on Mauser's website. Okay, let's start out by looking at a couple of different case styles out here. So again, the one that we have is the TOP3 or TO3PN, and you can see there's our original transistor again. And this chart uh, is floating around on the internet. Uh, it is posted multiple places on the Audio Karma website. It's posted on the DIY Audio website. Uh, it's actually didn't originate there. It's this is an old document, and I forget where the original one was. I don't even think, it, I think this is prior even to an internet thing. I don't know. But anyway, this is, if you want to pause the video and do a print screen and save this, um, that might be a good thing to do. Or if you use the snipping tool on Windows, you can make a picture of this and save it on your computer. So, here is the first one, and this is the original design case style that we're looking at. But if you notice, there's a couple other ones, okay? It is also known, and this is in TO3PN, and I think that stands for normal, <laughs> or this, the, the normal length, or MT100, and I believe that is a, uh, a Japanese signifier for this same case. So if you see TO3P, TO3PN or MT100, they're all this same case, okay? Some of them are encapsulated totally in plastic. Some of them have the collector on the back. And depending on what application you're using, uh, that may mean something. If they're using this surface tab as a, as a conductor, you may need to have one with the, with the collector exposed because the middle pin is the collector and it is connected to this tab. That's all one, one same connection. Now the other one is called a TO3PL and I have one here. And you can see it's same, same dimensions but it is a little bit bigger. So you can see if you look at the, if you line up the mounting hole, it's a little bit short. The pins are just slightly shorter. Okay. But again, the width spacing and everything is the same. You just have to remember that if you have a pre-drilled uh, mounting hole, this one, if you're trying to replace with this one, take note. <laughs> The holes are in a different place. You may have to re-drill and tap for that. Sometimes there's enough length that you can push this down like this and it'll still fit. You just drive the pins further down into the board or whatever. But keep in mind that you can do that. Another thing you'll notice is that a TO3PL, which is long length, or also known as a TO247, will not take the place of one of these because if you line up the pins the width part is good but the length if you notice if you line the hole up like that your pins don't line up so this would not be a good replacement for this <laughs> but quite often these are much larger they have much larger surface area to, to dissipate heat and these are typically uh, much higher power rating okay this is an MJL21194. And if you remember, they do make, and you may not remember, they do make this TO3 in an MJ21194. Okay? And if you look at the surface area that goes on the heat sink, they're similar. And that's why they make this bigger case style. So if you have an MJ21194 in this case, they make an MJL21194 that electronically is identical, but it may not fit on the heat sink the same way. Okay, these are all things you gotta, that's why I said this is not a quick answer. <laughs> if you really wanna learn how to do this, it's not a quick answer. Now in our case, we have those little modules and those modules, we can drill those holes wherever we want, you know, where the transistors mount to the little board underneath. So if this is a little bit longer, we will just drill our mounting holes a little bit further away from the boards because these bend up and go into that little circuit board module. 
So we can include this as an option. So we can use a TO3PN, an MT, MT100, TO3PL, and or a TO247, and all four of those will work. Now going back up to our video here, or to our uh, website, I'm just on Mauser's home page, okay, and I'm just going to do a search. I'm going to go semiconductors, discrete semiconductors, right, because a transistor is a discrete, a discrete semiconductor. We're going to do transistors, bipolar junction transistors, because that's what these are. And that's going to take us in this great big chart of all the different specs. And we can search by spec. And by the way, DigiKey, um, Farnell, uh, Newark, all, you know, whatever you want to call it, Allied, they all have this same, very similar search engine like this. So you notice one of the headings is case style, package or case. So what did we say we wanted? We wanted a TO3 P, right? So let's go down to TO3. I just skipped it over. So there's a TO3PN. Okay. There is a TO3PF, which I'm going to include that because it might be similar. Okay. There is a TO247, right? So we want to go up and include that. So there's TO247, and if I'm holding the control key down on my keyboard as I select these, so I can do multiples. So TO247, and I can also do MT100 if they have that. So let's go up there. I'm going too fast. And they do not have any of the MT ones listed. So let's apply filters. And these are all the transistors we have so far, okay? And you can see there are 27 transistors, so we've already narrowed it down, okay? So the next thing we want to do, and still we haven't broken it down yet all the way, but I'm going to click over here where it says in stock, okay? I don't know if this is, yeah, I think it's in the camera here. So I'm going to click in stock. So this is only going to list the ones that we can order right now. Okay. That narrows it down to 13 transistors that are actually available. So now you're going to go down. And here's our 13 transistors. Okay. Now, we want to first of all make sure that they're all within that 200 watt range. I'm going to I'm going to try to drill this down uh, to something as similar to the original as possible. So I'm going to click on 200 watt transistor. I'm not even looking at the voltage yet. And if I click on 200 watt, okay, I only have two transistors remaining. So let's look at that. And if I scroll down here, you can see I have, they're both TO247s, which are going to be the long package, the large package. And they are MJW21194, which I showed you that I have one, and MJW1302AG. All right. And one is a PNP and one is an NPN. And those are the only two transistors that are 200 watts or higher uh, that they have. And you can see one of them is a 30 megahertz component, and the other one is a 4 megahertz. So they are not compatible in any other way. You can see the current difference is different. The, mat, the voltages are a little bit different, but they're similar. Okay, Saturation voltages are quite different. So they're not compatible with one another. But if you had the pair, which we don't, they're showing, this is all they have in, that, in those packages. So Mauser is no help to us. They don't have what we need, and now we have to go to alternate, uh, an alternate source. 
So now let's try DigiKey. So here's DigiKey, and we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to go semiconductors, and I'm going to go all the way down to, you know, discrete semiconductors, and take it all the way down. Here's transistors. And the same thing, we're going to do case style. Okay, now it's in a different spot here. So let's scroll over. Packaging case. All right. So I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to go to the TO series, TO247. Okay, so TO3P full pack, TO3P3, TO3PF, TO3P. Okay, and those are all the ones they list. All right. So apply all. And we have 325 candidates. <laughs> and we can, now we're going to go and we're going to narrow down by power. And you can see DigiKey seems to have more transistors. So we're going to do in stock, and we still have 149. So I'll apply that. And then we're going to go down again. And I'm going to take anything that's 180 watts or bigger. Because for our application, that's, that's going to work. Okay. So I'm going to 180, 200, 220, and 250. Apply all. Okay. Now, if we, want, if we really care about transition frequency, we can sort by that. But before I get into that, I'm going to scroll down and I'm just going to see what we have, okay? Because what I want to do is I want to find something that I can find the complementary pair. I want to find something that I can find both the PNP and the NPN. So first of all, we have the NJW1302 and they're in stock. So if I click on that, I can do that. They have them. And this is definitely the transistor we want, right? So let's look at the data sheet. And you can see we need the 3281 as well. So let's go back, okay, and see if they have the NJW3281. Here it is, the next one in line. And they have 3486 of those in stock. So right there's your transistors. We can use that's the perfectly matched pair and I can add four of two or four of each of those in my shopping cart and I can purchase them. So we just found what we need. Now we can also look at some of the other ones. So let's say they didn't have those, all right? Let's go to there's the NJW21193 all right, but we don't see the NJW21194, which is the NPN version, right? At least not that I see right here. No. Do you see it? Nope, not listed. So that wouldn't work. MJW18020 G. So let's look at the data sheet for that. And then let's just go back. I can I don't even have to do this. Just uh, click on the data sheet. Let's scroll down. And usually it will say that they're what its complement is, and it appears at least as though they do not have a complement to that one. Normally on the data sheet, if there's a PNP equivalent or whatever, it will say a complement to so and so. It's not there, and you can see if you read it, it says it's specifically designed for motor control applications, high power supplies, okay, and probably it's not going to have, it has a decent uh, transition frequency and everything, but they do not have a suitable complement, so this one's no good for us, right? If I look at this one, 2STA2120. So what's that? All right, 
25 megahertz. This looks good. And let's see if they have a complement to 2STC 5948. See that? So, and unfortunately, the 2STC is not, not listed as available. 2STC 5948. And it's not in stock. So really, the only viable option we have, okay, is going to be these ones up here. Now there's also these NTEs, but if you notice, they don't have any of the complements to those. They're all NPNs. They don't have the PNP version. So that's how we're gonna do it. So again, you can just go and repeat that process at each website to see if they're available. Um, you can also look at the data sheets and find the complements. And sometimes you have to pie one transistor from one vendor. So for instance, they may have the NPN transistor at Mauser and the PNP at DigiKey. And you're gonna to have to place two orders and pay two shipping charges, which means the whole cost of your project's gonna go up. But that's the only alternative we have these days, okay? Now you can also go onto eBay and, you can, and, and uh, Amazon or whatever, or AliExpress and these places. And there'll be scads of these things listed. Just what you want. First thing that you type in, it'll pop up. Unfortunately, there is no guarantee if they're authentic transistors. Just like those SDK modules, there'll be a transistor. They will be in this case. They will have this part number on it. It may even have the manufacturer's number on it. And it could be a total fake. I've seen these before where you, you crack them open and the die in there is similar. Like for instance, this is an NPN transistor. The die would be like a 2N2222 small signal transistor mounted in a bigger case style. So guess what happens when you put high power to it? <laughs> It'll test like a transistor. You put it in a transistor tester, unless you have a curve tracer that can provide the level of current you need to, to drive this thing up you know, to its ratings, you would never know that it, is a, that it is a fake until you tried it. So buy your parts from reputable vendors. Now, the same thing holds true with any of these transistors. You would do the same process. You, you look at the, the specs that are most important to the circuit application and try to match up by that using the, uh, you know, the breakdown search pages on, you know, the websites like Mauser and DigiKey. Now, another way is to use NTE, okay? And uh, if you have one of these catalogs, I don't know if they still, if they're still in print, but they definitely have an, an online website and they also have a search application you can put on your computer or on your mobile device. And you can look up, it has a big cross reference in here and it will cross the component you're looking for over to an NTE equivalent. Then you can go to the data sheet of that NTE equivalent and look up the specs and then you can work backwards from that. And you can look up a couple different transistors and cross, if they both cross over to the same component, chances are they will be compatible with one another. Not my favorite way, but that can be a last resort. Another really good resource is there are books out there, such as this one, Modern Japanese Transistor Data and Substitution Manual. So if we need to replace a transistor, let's say a 2SD1175, that's gonna be like a, uh, for a television, okay? You can just look it up in this book. It tells you the basic things you need to know and then look at that, there's all your substitutes. So you could use a 2SD1398, 2SD957, go down the list, but the, the one caveat to that is sometimes you have to look these up and sometimes the pinout will be different. Like, especially in some of these, uh, 
these smaller transistors, you know, that are in these little cases like this, these small signal transistors, sometimes the emitter, collector, and base will be swapped around. Like it'll be uh, emitter, base, collector, or something like that, and the pins will be different. Even though electronically they're interchangeable, you have to make sure that you get the pins correct. So there are several books like this. And uh, this is one of my favorites, and I don't know if it's still in print. Uh, and it, even if it's out of print, you may be able to find it, like through Amazon or you know Barnes and Nobles or you know bookstores or online somewhere. But or there may be even a PDF version of this. I don't know. But there's there are several different books like this, and they're all very useful in the same thing. So. I know that some of you will be disappointed because you're looking looked for the two minute simple answer and you probably have already hit dislike and dropped off the video and that's fine. But in my experience, there is no easy way to do this other than the research that I showed you. If you understand about transistors and how they work and everything, this video probably wasn't going wasn't much good for you. Uh, but of course you wouldn't need to watch a video like this because you'd already know all this stuff. But for those of you who are new to this and who are serious about learning how to, how to work on circuits like this, especially vintage electronics, you need to know this stuff. There's no shortcut, okay? And you can watch these little 30 second videos, you know, where people hold this and then they hold this and you just assume that what they're doing is you know, is valid and you just go Google search and try to find it, well, you can do that. Maybe you'll get away with it. Maybe you won't. But I would rather know why I'm choosing the correct transistor and that I am actually choosing the, rec the correct transistor. Okay, hopefully that'll get you started. This was a very long, much longer video than I wanted it to be, but I don't know any other way to do it but to explain it to you in full detail. I hope it's helpful to you. Comment down below. And as always, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And uh, one last thing, you can use this video, this technique, for looking up any kind of component, whether it's a capacitor or a resistor, you know, MOSFETs, all the same, same idea. You're gonna, you're gonna search by characteristics and break it down. Make sure the case styles are the same and all that. It's same process. So I hope it was helpful. Stay well, everybody, and take care. Bye-bye.